Hey Law Winners, it's Law86 here with another video. How you guys doing? Now, countless people have reached out and said, would you please cover the atrocities that are happening in Xinjiang, which is a western region of China. Now, Xinjiang is the westernmost region. It's also the biggest province of China, uh, full of oil and all kinds of good stuff. But it also is home to the ethnic Uyghur people. And Uyghurs are an East Turkic people who are very unrelated to the uh, Han Chinese majority of China. There are rumors and allegations and now proof of re-education camps being set up by the Communist Party of China. Now, as I tried to wade through some of the Chinese internet and figure out what the heck was going on, it dawned on me probably the best way to get information about this was to talk to an actual Xinjiang ethnically Uyghur person. So that is exactly what I did. Enjoy. My name is uh, Arsene Hidayat. I'm an Australian, uh, Australian Uyghur, Uyghur Australian rights mm -hmm. activist. Um, I basically, I'm on social media, you know, doing my, you know, fighting for the Uyghur cause, legally, that is, legally fighting for the Uyghur cause, highlighting the situation, uh, making videos, having types of conversations like this. I run a popular Facebook page called Talk East Turkestan, which is the most popular Facebook page highlighting the Uyghur issue in the English language today. Um, yeah, that, that, that's what I do. I'm a, I'm a teacher by trade. And um, I do this part time. I'm not funded by anyone, so I do this when I can. And yeah, great, awesome. Well, before we uh, dive too much into that, I think we have to just get this get this out there. You keep saying the word Uyghur. Can you introduce to my audience yeah. who is not familiar with East Turkestan, yeah. Xinjiang, or the Uyghur situation? What what does that mean? Yeah. So uh, it, normally in the West or the English, they pronounce it as Uyghur, mm -hmm. uh, but the actual pronunciation is Uyghur. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we'll say Uyghur, so it's more, you know, palatable. Sure, that's right. Um, and so they they reside in what the, the world knows today officially as the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, which is today uh, yeah. northwest part of China. But the Uyghurs refer to this land as East Turkestan and or Uyghuristan. Uh, East Turkestan was um, essentially a country or um, a government that was set up, they had it was an independent state from 1933 to 1934, uh, which was called the East Turkestan Islamic Republic. Uh, its capital in Kashgar, which is the south of East Turkestan, uh, bordering with, uh, with Afghanistan. Um, and then it, when that fell apart, it had around 10 years of uh, trying to get back its country, fighting against uh, nationalists. And then in 1944 to 1949, um, with the help of the Soviets, they established the East Turkestan Republic with its capital in the north, uh, in the city of Gulja, which borders with, say, present-day Kazakhstan and Russia and the Mongolia. Um, so that's what we refer to as East, East Turkestan. And, um, yeah, and ever since, so when the communists came in in 1949, uh, dissolved East Turkestan, um, and then a few years later, so that the, the Uyghurs do not the Uyghurs and the other Turkic people do not re revolt against the Chinese against the Chinese state. They gave us this special name called the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, uh, autonomous by name, but it actually has no auto autonomy at all. It's fully under China's control, just like all these other autonomous regions, like what we refer to as Southern Mongolia or Tibet. Um, yeah. Right. So the ethnic group, the predominant ethnic group of this area are called the Uyghurs then. Uh, you are ethnically Uyghur yes. then. And yes. so what is this? So people are talking about this this conflict. If uh, there's this autonomous region uh, in Xinjiang, the Xinjiang Autonomous Region, where these Uyghurs reside, why is there this uprising? Why is there these cultural clashes? What is what's happening here? Well, for the for the past 70 odd years, uh, Uyghurs have been treated as second or third class citizens. If actual autonomy was given from day one, if actually, if actual autonomy was given to Tibetans and Mongolians and Uyghurs alike, I mean, there would be no clashes. Uh, it's because, uh, uh, let's stay off on the genocide that's been happening for the three, four years. For the longest time, we've had our language banned, our language changed every, like, so the script of the language changed every so often. So for example, my grandfather's generation, they were able to write in the Arabic script, 
Then when it came to my mom, my mother's generation, she she actually went through the Cultural Revolution. They changed that script into Latin script. So you had a whole generation of Uyghurs suddenly become illiterate overnight. And then, um, and then you had like this generation who were born in the 80s go back to the Arabic script. Um, and so, and discriminated for, for jobs. I have many of my friends that were discriminated. They couldn't get jobs simply because they were Uyghur. So you have, you've, for the longest time, you had this apartheid state set. Um, we know that in 79, China introduced the one-child policy to the whole of China uh, for minorities. They introduced the two-child policy, which is for the Uyghurs as well. And, you know, normally Turkic people and Muslim people, they have many, many kids. So a lot of kids were killed, aborted in this process. And uh, many denialists say, well, minorities were lucky enough to have the two-child policy. Well, we're saying that was China's way of trying to ease these minorities to, to get to the one-child policy as well. Of course, we'll never actually know. Um, but yeah, the, the, this is why you have so many conflicts and you have uprisings happening every 10 or so years where people people are culled. So right after the Tiananmen Square massacre, we in 1990, we had the Baran massacre, which, uh, you know, the people got together to actually stage protests to to go against that two-child policy. In 97 in Gulja, there was another massacre uh, for religious freedoms because simple freedoms is praying, having a beard, having a headscarf, going to the mosque, um, you know, uh, going to state-run mosques. I mean, we, we would be so glad if we could have state-run mosques again in that region. Um, even that, those don't really exist as well. Um, and then 2009, with the, with the Shoguan incident, the Shoguan massacre, followed by the Urumqi massacre. So every 10 or so years, there is a culling of Uyghur because, you know, every generation, um, people tend to forget what happened before because it's not taught at schools. Like, you know, in the United States and even Mike, in, in Australia, we're taught of the atrocities of our governments and then people learn from the history but you know in china they're not really taught uh these things um yeah so the coexistence of like the the han majority and the the uyghur people do you think this is more do you think the clash and the the diametric opposition is more due to the cultural differences or is it more a government thing because you mentioned that if it was actually granted autonomy you could exist in a chinese state Whereas, like, if I talk to, um, I find it interesting, when I talk to Inner Mongolian people that are ethnically Mongolian, um, even, you know, when you bring up autonomy, they still, a lot of people I talk to don't believe that they could coexist in a Chinese state, <clears throat> simply because of the nomadic culture is very, very different than the collectivism, you know, under the Han, the Han rule. So is that similar in, with the, the Uyghur people? I mean, fr from my experience, um... Uh, when I used to go there, generally the people would get along with each other. It was just when the government, because the government makes the Uyghurs look bad. So, for example, um, I, I, and I'm sure you've witnessed this as well in the eastern in the eastern provinces. Uh, whenever they hear of the word like Xinjiangren or Uyghurren, they think pickpocketer or someone who makes um, kebab um, or, or everyone's riding camels. Um, and so the that there is a stereotype that Uyghurs are generally not good people. And, and, and this is the message by the government. Honestly, in, in my perspective, if China were actually doing what they're preaching, we wouldn't have outbursts. We wouldn't have, um, you know, people crying out for their rights. And, and we see this recently with the concentration camps. A lot of people who have been politically silent all their life came out because their families started to get also passed because um, otherwise people remain silent on the issue. So many may disagree with me, but from my observations, if autonomy was given from day one and they were equal with Han people, uh, I've talked to Uyghur people and, and they say they wish they could change uh, the name Vizu or Uyghur on their ID card to Han so that they can have the same rights as them. So, yeah. Okay, that's interesting. They technically that's, the propaganda yeah. says the opposite, obviously. If you listen to CCP propaganda, it's that yeah. the Uyghur people actually have more benefits and rights than the average Chinese person, which is clearly soft power propaganda. I can see right through that. And having yeah. known Uyghur people, I know that they are treated, especially in other regions of China, like second-class citizens. That is a very true observation. Yeah. But to play devil's advocate, though, 
Um, if you're talking about this, uh, the, you know, the concentration camps that are, that are highly contested in some of the parts of the internet, at least, um, but then kind of widely regarded as a, as a real thing in a lot of, uh, you know, from yeah. Western speeches and news articles and things like that. You see a lot of pushback about that, but before we get, uh, before we get into that, can you explain why these concept, well, maybe what are these concentration camps, why they exist? And then I really want to know why... If China was to grant autonomy and there was actually they're trying to push for ethnic harmony, why would they need to do something like this? That's clearly going to to piss off the, the weaker people. Why would they be doing? Why would they be pushing for concentration yes. camps? Well, the thing is, the China actually doesn't want a multicultural society of fifty six ethnic groups. Um, this is just for show. Um, the Uyghurs themselves are too different. They want them. To become more Hanified. Uh, people argue that, oh, that they are, it's a war against the religion of Islam and things like this, but it's actually not. Islam does make up a huge, uh, huge part of the culture of the Uyghurs, but we have to remember that the, um, the, the, Huizu, the, the, Hui, the, the Hui Muslims and other Muslims, generally speaking, have been living quite freely. And I know many of my friends that you that would that would go to like Landru and all these other Hui areas to study Islam. And when they went to these areas, they saw people, the, the women fully in black, and they heard the call to prayer, and the Chinese officials would go to the Friday prayers, and um, they were living quite freely. And um, it's only in the last couple of years that the, the Hui Muslims have also uh, suffered a little bit, uh, a little bit of oppression, but not to the extent the Uyghurs have. So we can't say it's total war against Islam. The thing is, the Uyghurs are too different. Us simply practicing Islam, looking the way we are, speaking the language that we speak, which is nothing to do with Chinese, is in itself they see that as separatism. So, so, so we would see people being locked up for going overseas, for going to Turkey, or for going to the United States. That's too different for them. Um, and not going by legal, like they have a Chinese passport and they go to various countries in the Middle East and do business in other countries that have no affiliations. There are people, and we know this is not um, uh, a thing to do with the actual religion of Islam because there have been people locked up in these camps who have never prayed a day in their life. And if you, if you actually were, work, were to ask them the 101 of what Islam was, they wouldn't be able to answer you. So we say that this is a geopolitical thing that to ask, crush any form of difference and when they mean to harmonize with the rest of China it means for the Uyghurs to become Chinese um, and for the ones that don't comply they remain in these camps they get killed and generally speaking the ones that do uh, end up leaving one way or another or they're set, set away to labor camps and there's different levels of uh, punishment that they go through so this is the main reason why, but, 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 but you will hear people talking about, oh, it's against Islam. And it is. I mean, mosques are being broken down, cemeteries, so anything cultural, any, you know, Uyghur shrines and all these things are being taken down. So, so it becomes, because I'm not sure if you've been to East Turkestan or Xinjiang, when you go there, it's many people go, am I really in China? Because it, it looks like For another sure. part of the Middle I East. Just, even, even the Hawaii region of yeah. Ningxia, I felt like I had been removed from China. The concentration camp, I think a lot of people do think that it is strictly a backlash against religion. But the same could be said for anything that is not Chinese. And I wanted my audience to understand that when you say mosques are being dismantled, so are churches. So, so, so is anything really that doesn't hold the Chinese identity. Yeah. So I'm glad that you brought up the fact that it's not a war against Islam. What I've seen, the animosity that the Chinese government has towards minorities is not the ones that look Chinese. It's the ones that physically look different from Chinese people. And that is yeah. obviously, you know, a, a threat to them. If you can't Hanify, you can't bring someone into your general sphere of Hanification, then that's a threat to, to, to rule, right? So the thing is, yeah. this these concentration camps where you have forced labor, I've seen the proof, I've seen these ads where you can basically buy Uyghur people to either put out performances or work in factories and things like this. Yeah. This exists. This is a real thing, right? There is a counter argument, though, that I keep hearing that I get hit with all the time. And I, maybe you can address this a lot better than I could. But usually when genocide, even when we're talking about cultural genocide, if it's important enough to an ethnic group that is being marginalized or genocided, you would typically see a huge, a huge refugee situation in neighboring countries. Um, and we just don't simply see those numbers. You don't see 
hundreds of thousands of Uyghur people running away on mass, right? So how, how can you explain to somebody that uses that as the argument that genocide can't be happening if people are just coexisting and these concentration camps don't exist because they're not running away to different countries? One, China isn't Syria or China isn't Bosnia. Um, they, you know, in those countries, they don't have high tech surveillance and their borders are not shut. And in those countries where there's those war torn countries, they have places to go. Now, we don't have hundreds of thousands of people leaving the area, but we did have thousands of people leaving the area from the south going through Laos, Vietnam, and they ended up in Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia. And then they got spread out through all those areas. Mostly, most of them ended up in Turkey. So we do have people leaving, but people are not able to leave. Um, anyone that knows anything about China, their borders are really strict, surveillance and if you, if you look up uh, one of the ways that you can end up in a concentration camp, there are 48 ways. If suddenly you end up selling off your things, if you're selling off your furniture and cars, that, that's a big red flag and they, they are able to track that. If you start buying camp gear, you can end up in a camp. So any, anything that could um, let the government know, the regime know that you're moving, they'll catch on to it. Their borders are tight. Um, the biggest security personnel, their police force, their army in the world. So people automatically compare the what's happening in Myanmar and all these places. No one is set up like uh, China. And when we go back to so, sort of comparing it with what happened to the Jews, if the, if the Nazis could do what China was doing, they would. The Nazis didn't have the technology back then. So, for example, organ harvesting, the selling of the hair, forced marriages. I mean, China are actually... Not just because killing the Uyghurs is easy. Why just kill them? Why not make money off them? So that's what, that's much more. It would be a blessing. It would be a mercy for a lot of Uyghurs if they could just die. That's the difference. There, 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 is, there are things worse than death. So when you, 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 can't, you can't compare all the other regions. This, this is one of the main reasons you don't see people living en masse. And even if you were to leave... See that hard road that I told you about? One, they got to go through the south of China, which in itself, you're going through all these borders to get there. All right. Okay. Why not go through Afghanistan, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, all these, Russia? Why not, why not these areas? Because those countries sell um, the Uyghurs back. They, they are all client states. And there, there have been thousands of accounts where Uyghurs are sold per head, you know, um, back to China. So that route is impossible unless some ethnic Kazakhs got to Kazakhstan and um, they were almost sent back. Uh, but because they were ethnically Kazakh, certain rights organizations came in, they got their day in court and they were able to leave to third countries. So ethnic Kazakhs have had some sort of luck, but no way for Uyghurs. Right, right. So it's very similar to what North Korea does, basically. Yeah. And yeah, the yeah well, that's the thing. Well. What, like, uh, the same question could be asked. Well, why, why don't we have th hundreds of thousands of North Koreans leaving North Korea? You know, like, you, you can't use that argument. China does a lot of things poorly, but there's one thing China does well, and that is surveillance. And if yeah. they want to, to stop someone from leaving, they will stop someone from leaving. Yeah. It's not some porous border like you have, like you said, in Syria or something like this. Yeah. Um, and that's interesting that these other countries will sell them back to, to China. What countries, I mean, because this is new to me, what countries do you think are the most complicit in this, in this kind of immoral, immoral trade back? Uh, you got Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, like all, all, all these Turkic nations that, that we are supposed to be brothers and sisters with. Um, you know, obviously they're not fully independent. They've still got that Soviet style running of their nations they've got their own issues so they sell them back so there there isn't this brotherhood that many people think we've recently heard reports from saudi arabia egypt definitely uh pakistan as well uh turkey uh has had some official and unofficial ones where they're selling them back to they're, they're deporting the uyghurs to tajikistan and then off to um uh, back into east turkestan uh but the the turkish government has totally denied this. um so yeah we these countries are doing it so yeah so we've established why people are or we've established that people are running away let's go back to why they would be running away so can you explain the life of a Uyghur in a in a Chinese concentration camp what happens in these places 
So uh, I, I've had the the opportunity to actually interview some of these former concentration camp detainees. Um, they were telling me they were on anywhere between four to five hundred um, calorie diets. They are given some sort of soupy goo uh, with like um, bowls, like a uh, like a bun, a steamed bun every morning. They are taught to repent because uh, I mean there are people in there for religious reasons. So they are taught to repent because they used to repent to God. And who are they repenting to? They were made to repent to President Xi. So they would have him plastered up and they'd have his speeches up and they had to write letters to him. Um, basically, uh, confessional. A lot of these Uyghurs, some of them who don't know Chinese, I mean, one of the reasons why people, uh, what they're saying is, oh, we have to teach the Uyghurs Chinese. They can't speak Chinese. But even a lot of the Uyghurs that are going in there, you had deans of universities, people who are on the verge of retiring who had given their lives for the Communist Party, worked for the Communist Party for 30, 40, some 50 years. Even people that had already retired, you know, had medals of honor and all these things, they were ended up in these camps. So going through, um, you know, language training, um, uh, chants, they had to chant, uh, brainwashing, um, and knocking out any sense of re re religiosity or sort of Uyghurness. So uh, one concentration camp detainee I was talking to, she was given some food and she, she, she's quite young. At that time, she was 31 or 32. She realized that there was a much older lady who could, she could go without food. And so she gave her food to her and the guard saw that and um, beat her. And once she was beaten, she said, oh God. But in, Al in say Arabic, we would say, oh Allah, you know, ya Allah, meaning calling out to God. Oh, she's got something in her, that, that ounce of religiosity. So they kept on beating her until like saying, who is your Allah? You know, so torture, rape, gang rape of both men and women. Um, it doesn't matter what sex you are. So a lot of the women go through gang rape. Their blood is taken uh, every morning and they are injected with uh, unknown fluids in the evening. Um, and, and these women were telling me that their periods no longer started to come. They no longer had periods. Um, there's one concentration camp detainee by the name of Mikhail Tursun. She had triplets. She lost one of her triplets once uh, because uh, her her triplets were young and uh, she she hadn't finished feeding them. They, they hadn't gone through the feeding process and they were trying to feed one of her babies and one, she lost one of her babies while she was in the camp. Um, uh, and, and just, um, you know, attacking their dignity like uh, we Muslims, before we pray, we wash ourselves with water. So apparently uh, there was one concentration camp detainee by the name of Zumrat Dawood. She told me that one concentration camp detainee went through a situation where, where she was urinated on by guards. And they were saying, you know how you Muslims wash yourselves with the water before you pray? Wash yourselves with this urine. So going through psychological and uh torturing them that way as well. It's clear to me, and I think the audience probably understand that the concentration camps exist for monetary reasons now. I think you've really highlighted that. And that's that's a very CCP characteristic for sure. Um, also, it seems like a very, very much contained, easier way to control population. Uh, especially when you bring up things like forced sterilization and abortions. I mean, you're basically insinuating the Chinese government is trying to limit the numbers of the future of, of weaker people. Is that right? Yes. Um, and and it's definitely recognized by the by by the Geneva Convention that it, sure. that that it's in itself is a form of genocide, and this was proven in Chinese government documents from their own websites. If you look at the work of Adrian Zenz, I'm sure you've heard of him, where he basically sourced the Chinese government themselves, um, and they he was able to basically present that this was going on. Um, and one and another reason, I mean, we say reason, but an excuse for um, the Uyghurs going into these camps was because they ended up having a third child. And that was another reason. So it's like they're, they're using excuses, you know, basic law breaking principles to be, have an excuse to throw someone in a camp. Yeah. But, but, but then, then there are people with, they, they have no idea what they've done. They, they just end up there. I mean, literally, there, there are people, I mean, the Uyghurs, especially on the outside, um, do their very best not to attend political protests, not to go against the Chinese, you know, and th they do all that and still get punished. That's, that's why you have this big backlash, because you've got people uh, protesting and being activists, where normally, if these camps really never came, 
90% of the activists that, that exist today would not exist. I'm not going to play devil's advocate here, but I've noticed a disturbing amount of, um, and my, my audience knows my position on this, but a disturbing amount yeah. of uh, misinformation or disinformation on the internet, and specifically on places like Reddit, where yeah. the conversation may bring up Uyghur activism or what's happening in Xinjiang. And then the comments below will be steered, you know, upvoted to, to deny such things, right? You'll see a huge, even if it's like not on a pro CCP forum or something, but you'll see a huge amount of these comments being upvoted while anyone's even bringing up the issue or having maybe a, a less skeptical opinion about this and saying, yeah. listen, I really think something's going on in Xinjiang gets downvoted um, to the point where now I'm even seeing entire forums dedicated or threads dedicated to denying the, the existence of these camps, denying the fact that Uyghurs are oppressed. What do you what do you say to these people, and why why do you think this is happening? Because I'm talking about Westerners, like I'm talking about 15 year old Western yeah. kids that maybe even their parents are from a Muslim country, right? Yeah. What is leading them to deny this? Yeah. And who who's pushing this the most? Which country? The the United States. The United States Secretary Pompeo. They 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 they're the strongest allies of the Uyghurs right now. The Uyghurs are predominantly Muslim, and we know like I'm someone who 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 calls a spade a spade. Now, the U.S. has a poor track record in Muslim countries, bombing the hell out of them. You and I both know that. And so for the U.S. to suddenly come out and protect all these Muslims, obviously people are going to be like, oh, what the hell's going on here? So you, you kill a bunch of Muslims for the past your years and you, you suddenly want to stick up for these guys. So I get people get confused about that. But just because the U.S. are holding up the flag for the Uyghurs does not mean what's happening there isn't true. It, there is a genocide going on. Um, uh, and, and so China uses this against the U.S. as well. Hey, look, and, and they'll say, well, um, we, we've set up vocational schools. What have you done? You just bombed Afghanistan and Iraq back to the Stone Age. So I get that. And then with these young people, uh, the young people, they, they, they deny or, or they're skeptics of everything. I mean, they, the people even say vaccines don't work. Like, it's that type of generation. Uh, but I would say is, well, if China have nothing to hide and if I'm a liar, prove me a liar. Get independent investigators in there. What happens when journalists go in? You know, Iran, the Iranian regime, they're like, you know what? Come, independent investigators, see if, we have, if we're working on nukes and uranium. And they checked it out and, you know, they're signing deals and all this. Can China do the same? What happens when journalists go into the area? I, I know many journalists, when they want to actually do, try and do an unbiased documentary, their documentary ends up turning into well, we were followed by 20 black cars. Why are you following these these journalists? If it's so free, you've got nothing to hide. Um, why don't why not let people in? I would love to be proven wrong. Do, like I would love if there was no genocide. Why 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 are we going to push this for? So that that's what you got to ask. And then you've got like characters going. Well, I um, what's his name? You've got some characters out there, you know, like riding on bikes and, you know, I've been to the Xinjiang region. I'm not blocked from anywhere. And no, 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 let proper independent investigators in. Yeah. You know, let me in. actually talk to the people and um, see what's up and, and let people in that are familiar with the region, you know, because uh, I, I think was it you that went into North Korea? Um, and, and you see like this pomp ticket sort of stage tours and, you know, it's fake. Like people know it's fake when they go into North Korea. They know that's not the real North Korea. So that's the same thing happening um, uh, with the Uyghurs. You know, if they got nothing to hide, why not let people in? Yeah, I'm waiting for that that's independent I journalism. I mean, you see, like you saw the BBC piece, and even they admitted this is a Potemkin village. Basically, this was set up prior. Where, why? It, it, they're <laughs> allowing plenty of people and influencers to go to Xinjiang. I would never be allowed there, but they're yeah. allowing plenty of people to do yeah. so. But these are very adamant, very adamant deniers of, of what's happening. And I find it very yeah. immoral, number one. And number two, very creepy that a Westerner with Western values would actively deny something like this and do such a lazy job of, of trying to disinform the public by walking around Urumqi and saying, look, everything's mm. fine. Where's the concentration camps? That makes absolutely no sense. It's like it's like uh, going back to the Holocaust times and being in Finland and being like, where's the concentration camps? You know, you're in a main city where everyone is allowed to roam freely and you're denying the concentration camps. It makes absolutely no sense. But I think it's honestly uh, working. It's uh, working. Uh, another, another simple thing is a lot of my friends' parents, uh, some have left the concentration camps. 
they're technically Chinese citizens. Sure. How come they can't apply for a Chinese passport and leave and right. visit their children? Sure. What's going on there? They've got the money. What, what, why is stopping them from leaving? Right. That that's another red flag. Right. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, when you get put on a watch list for buying like a knife, I think you know that there's some sort yeah. of control happening in this region. I'm just, yeah. I've been particularly disgusted by this movement of Westerners that, um, even if you remove the Xinjiang situation, that really prop up the, the Communist Party of China. And it's a modern phenomenon. It's not something I've traditionally seen in the past. I just, using Western outlets and freedom of speech to, to celebrate a regime that takes away those rights is so ironic to me. And I, I, I don't know how or why it's working on younger people right now. That's really bothering me. It's, that means Chinese propaganda does work. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's the whole white monkey issue. Get a white man to say sure. what you want to say. They'll they'll believe it. Sure. That's why they're doing it. Have you seen these propaganda videos? They are so poorly made, yeah. but they're so effective. Sure, sure. Do you think Do you think that they're most a lot of this though is directed at a domestic Chinese audience, or what is what is China's modus operandi to like make the world believe that these camps don't exist, or that Xinjiang oppression doesn't exist? Because I know that they've successfully sold their own citizens on that. Um, what is their biggest motivation of trying to convince the world of this? Uh, technology mm -hmm. and something that you've highlighted a lot, TikTok mm -hmm. on social media. I mean, the, uh, and and for the longest time, just traditionally, you, you know, we um, th this country to the east, China. I mean, they're not known to you know, it, you know, when when we think China, we think the Great Wall of China. We think thousands of years of tr tradition and uh, delicious food. So they're not known for this, like cuddly buddhists you know like yeah. this sort of thing whereas we we would see like um say countries in the west say especially in recent history with the u.s and all these like warmongering countries so china is not known for sure. that um and, and i think this is why and uh this generation this gen z they have not seen uh china china in action in war they have seen the west in war so it, it's it's even western media show like what we don't we don't show on our own media, on the Western media, how bad China has been. Mm -hmm. And so, and chi it, because of China's rise, there's this notion, oh, well, America or the West are just jealous. They want to bring China down. Sure. And uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense for sure. Um, so what is the end game for, for you? What is the Uyghur activism? What do you, what do you want to see the world do about this? So like basically in a simple terms, why should people care? Uh, well, a genocide is going on. Uh, the people promised, you know, after the Jewish Holocaust that this would never ever happen again. And it is happening again, right in front of our eyes. I had, um, I had the honor of uh, interviewing a UN human rights lawyer, uh, Emma Riley, um, who works at the UN. And she was saying that the Ch China was giving names of Uyghurs who were going to speak against them um, at the Human Rights Council. And, and, and that was a big shock because we go to the UN, we trust this organization to put pressure or, you know, um, do something to, so that, to put pressure on China so that they don't genocide or kill their people or, you know, um, uh, oppress people. But even that organization has been corrupted and bought. And we've seen the World Health Organization, which is connected to the UN, also, um, you know, be... Uh, uh, be a trumpet for uh, for, for China, um, and you know recently we've seen China being voted into the Human Rights Council, and so really we're we're saying, look, if you don't stop China, you're going to have a lot of countries mimic China, um, and then you've got other countries buying up their uh, AI technology, the high tech surveillance we've seen in South America, India, um, and so we're just going to have more and more um, oppression. It's a promise. I mean, sh what we shouldn't really be trying to convince people to stop genocide. It's it's it should be humanly innate to do that. But China has gotten to such a level, and this is and th this for me um, is also the fault of the world. I mean, in, in, instead of trying to appease China all this time, uh, the, the the West, especially especially the United States and their allies, do play a part in how strong China has become. And now you, you, you can't stop them. And the only way you can stop them is through through sanctions and boycotts. But, you know, people value the dollar more than human mm -hmm. lives. Yeah, it's a shame. Um, do, you, do you see a positive response uh, taking form now in the rest of the world's response? Say the Western countries are giving out statements of condemnation. Sure. Muslim countries are silent. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, because they go, well, this thing will go and pass. Um, and most of these quote unquote Muslim countries are client states anyway. Um, so the, the issue has been highlighted a lot. But again, these countries push it over to the UN. You handle these human rights issues. That's why we that's why we give you hundreds of millions of dollars every year. And the UN goes, well, China just bought me. So we're in this, you know, we, we don't know who to pass the people are just passing the button. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's highlighted statements of condemnation, sanctions. Um, certain laws have been passed in various countries, global Magnitsky acts, but what are you actually going to do that's tangible? Sure, sure. There's nothing actually tangible happening. So what can you tell people to do if, they, if they're passionate about this? You, you, can, you can't just kill willy-nilly. No. I mean, one of the concentration camps that I was talking to, uh, the detainee I was, I was talking to, I mean, the number of concentration camps right now, according to Adrian Zenz, based on a report done by the Radio Free Asia, was anywhere between 500 upwards of 1,000 and perhaps even more mm -hmm. camps. This one woman, Mikri Tursun, who stayed in one of those camps, she stayed there for three months and only got out because uh, she, she was married to an Egyptian or had Egyptian citizenship. She goes, in a three-month period, she saw nine women mm -hmm. die in a three-month mm -hmm. period from one mm -hmm. cell. So you can only guess. And now recently, it has been found that a lot of these camps now have crematories. Right. Right next to right next door to, to right. the camps, and these are isolated places. Why, why do you have a crematory in an isolated place right next door to a camp? So God knows how many people have been sure. killed. Sure. You know, and and and, and uh, China themselves have recently <clears throat> boasted, saying that they have educated. Get this: one point three million Uyghurs per year for the last six years. If you include two thousand and twenty, um, that makes it around eight million. And that's their numbers. The, 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 the Western numbers, uh, US State Department are saying two, three million. The UN saying over a million. But China's saying, no, I've educated eight million. And they're not hiding it anymore. They don't care um, because they've realized that, well, that's all you've got, statements of condemnation. Well, I might as well boast about this. So where can people find more information? Where can people find you? So you got talk, ad talk is Turkestan. Mm -hmm which is um, on Facebook and YouTube. Um, our, our YouTube channel is not doing that good. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're there. Uh, I'm on Twitter at uh, Arslan underscore okay. Hidayat. And you can also go to the Uyghur Revival Association. We're newly set up, but it's uh, Uyghur, U-Y-G-H-U-R-R-A dot mm -hmm. org. Um, and that's our website. Um, I'll put all, I'll, I'll yeah, put all that stuff in the description <laughs> pinned comments so you guys can go check that out. I hope you've uh, you've. I hope someone's been educated out there. I've learned quite a few new things today, so I appreciate it. Is there anything you want to add? Um, your final message? Yes. Yeah, so for all the denialists out there, one question they cannot answer is: If China has nothing to hide, how come independent investigators can't go in, and the loved ones, even if they are out of the camps, how come they cannot get a Chinese passport and leave? That those two questions can never ever be denied by anybody. Yeah, and I, I leave that as an open question to anyone out there that would uh, be so b bold to, to deny something like this. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Thank you so much to Arslan for participating in the interview. Fascinating, fascinating guy. And uh, I've actually posted all the links that he sent to me for proof in the uh, description. So if you want to fact check everything yourself, also don't forget to check out his pages and support the cause. I think it's a good one. Don't forget if you want to support the channel, patreon.com slash 86 I answer my messages every single morning. Uh, we have a great dialogue, great community going on. It's the only way this uh, channel can stay afloat, really. So I appreciate your guys' generosity, and I'll catch you on the next one.